Welcome to our continuing study in the book of Proverbs. Today we're going to uh, cover Proverbs 17, 1 through 12. I think you'll find it to be much more than just meets the eye. But before we go into the word of God, we should always lay down a foundation of prayer. So I invite you to please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, by your hand, you created it, you ordained it. Lord, there's nothing in your kingdom that's a coincidence. And so, Father, thank you for summoning us all here, whether it's uh, live, online, whether it's at a future date that someone's listening to this recording. Lord, you made a divine appointment for us. And so we just uh, are so thankful that you are our God and we trust you and we trust the truth of your word. We just ask, Father, that you would give us a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, that we might understand the things that are here, that they might seep deep down into our hearts, and that we might be able to reflect this wisdom to a world who is in such need of your truth. Father, we just uh, commend ourselves into your hands for the next hour plus, and just thank you so much in the precious and powerful name of your Son, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as you can see from the list of questions on the opening screen, it's a number of topics. Um, and yet we'll discover, like we've been discovering in almost every chapter that we've taken a look at in Proverbs, that there is connectivity between verses. And so one of the uh, challenges I have for you this week is... After reading these, we'll, we'll obviously go through some teaching today, but um, after looking at this, try to find as many connections that we didn't mention, because you're going to find them all over the place, not just connections to passages that came before, but also other passages in the Word of God. Um, it really, like most, most uh, Bible books, seem to be a focus through which God speaks and connects his thoughts, this one particularly, uh, there's just lots of discoveries in that. So let's jump in. I've entitled this one, Peace, Harmony, and Strife, Part 1. And so this is going to take us on a tour of everyday life situations through a series of one- and two-line proverbs. Many people get to this middle section of proverbs and go, it's just dense, it's thick. What, uh, you know, it just seems like this random collection of thoughts much more than that, as we'll find out together. So Proverbs 17.1 says, Better a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. And so when we look at this, and we try to work through it, we first need to look at some of the vocabulary words. The uh, word uh, quietness is shalva, which means peacefulness. It's an absence of controversy, tumult. It's just, it's quietness. And so better is a dry morsel with quietness. Now, a dry morsel is a very poor meal. In fact, in the day that this was written, you typically, if you had a dry morsel, it was either bread or meat, but it wasn't, there wasn't anything to dip it in. Typically, you dip it in a gravy or something that would uh, contain additional nutrition and, and, and flavor. So this really... Uh, makes it seem like it's a situation of poverty, a dry morsel. Now, the word strife, rib, means contesting, controversy, backbiting, bickering, contention, lots of arguments, lots of turmoil. So better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. Now, on the surface, this is pretty straightforward. It's better to be poor and at peace than being wealthy in a contentious household. That's true. The stress of a household is, is you and I have experienced in our life. If there's stuff going on, no meal is pleasant. But Solomon's really not stopping there. There's something more here, and so we should be alert for a remez. A remez is a hint of something deeper. And so the word, it comes from the word feasting. This is why we need to be diligent students of the Bible. The word feasting, zabak, means a meat animal that is sacrificed on an altar. It's, it's part of the Mosaic law of sacrifices. And this term is a technical and very specific term. So it says, better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting. This is a special kind of feasting. 
because this is an animal that was sacrificed on an altar at one of the tabernacles or temples or synagogues. And so Leviticus 7 sets forth some very precise requirements for the sacrifice of an animal that was being sacrificed to God. And the Mosaic law points out that a portion of many of the meat sacrifices were given to the priests who lived and served at the temple or synagogue or tabernacle as part, this was part of their support. So when you think about this better than a house full of feasting, well, that is not just a house, it's the house where this feasting is going on, which would be the temple, tabernacle, or synagogue. Like I say, there's a lot more here than comes and meets the eye. See, the priests were to model godly behavior. They were to, ones that, that people would lo look up to as examples. And if you're going to be taking your meal in the house of God, it should be a thing of quiet fellowship, thankfulness, peace, joy. It should be something that models for everyone. And yet, it says here, better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. We have a picture of plenty to eat at the, in, in this house, the house of God, but those who are, at the who are at the table are fighting ungodly behavior. So you have that, that, that uh, comparison, and it means that it's just a little bit more than what meets the eye, as many of Proverbs are. We just have to dig a little bit. All right, verse 2, a wise servant will rule over a son who causes shame, and will share an inheritance among the brothers. Well, there's a lot, again, going on in this particular proverb. So we look at this. In the culture of Proverbs, in the day that it was written, servants often had an opportunity in their service to a master to prove themselves to be faithful, wise, trustworthy. So those servants would distinguish themselves, just like we do today, in whatever jobs or vocations we have, we have an opportunity to distinguish ourselves. In the case of someone that did this, there's something else that's involved. The master of the house has a son. The word for son, remember, is bene, which means the builder of the family name, whose behavior brought shame to the family name. He was a builder of the family name, but this son causes shame and that's what is a, a problem to the master. So what would happen is, in the case of a servant that was quite faithful, that master would assign the trusted servant to be the keeper of the son, would go with the son wherever the son went, would be advising there, usually someone who is older and, and clearly wiser. And so the word shame here is bush, which means a son of scandal or shame. So the son of this wealthy person, everybody knows in the community what the shame is, whatever that was that that son did. Now, this particular servant would be a few years older than the particular son, but close enough in age as a contemporary to have personal influence to him. So it would be someone perhaps, you know, five, ten years older. So there was still a, an age difference where a parent may be 20, 30, 40 years older than the kids. So this individual would be assigned there, and what this individual is now tasked with doing is to be a role model to get the wayward son to modify his behavior. And as a result of doing that, the reward for this servant would be to be named as an heir to the master. Remember that when the master died, his estate was divided up among the sons. And so the eldest son, which is implied in this particular um, pro proverb, would inherit a double portion. That's what always what the eldest son got was a double portion and then single portions for the remaining sons of whom this particular wise servant would be given. Now, I find it very interesting that Solomon would talk about this particular situation when considering what was happening in his own household. You see, Solomon had sons. And his oldest son was marked for bad behavior. He was cocky, sure of himself, had all the answers, 
got himself in trouble. And as we see, this is almost a prophecy of the future in, in that I'm, I'm finding in Solomon's words, because Solomon wasn't dead when he wrote this. He was very much alive and very much in control of his faculty. So he wasn't senile. He wasn't at the end of his days. He was still some years away from his demise. So let's look at that. Solomon, by the way, disobeyed God. He multiplied for himself wise horses, silver, and gold. God then said the following. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, because you've done this, you've not kept my covenant and statutes, which I commanded you. I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days. In other words, while you're alive, for the sake of your father, David, I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have cho chosen. Let's give one try. So we look at this, whether God told Solomon this before he penned this proverb or after, I just find it very unique as we look at the history of things that are said. And so Solomon's son was Rehoboam. He succeeded his father after his father's death. Now, by the time Solomon reached the age of his death, the taxation levels to support what he had going on in the kingdom were incredible. And so people just begged Rehoboam, you're, you're now going to be, you're now king, can you please loosen these, these taxes? Of course, Rehoboam kicked out his father's advisors, got a bunch of young bucks around him who said, no, sock it to him, man, you're the king. Do anything you want. Well, a delegation led by Jeroboam, who was a former servant of Solomon's, you can see how this is connected. Solomon had overseen, had, had appointed to oversee the taxation of the tribe of Joseph. And what happened with the harsh treatment by Rehoboam, the northern tribes revolted, chose Jeroboam as their king, and you now had a split in the kingdom of north and south, as you see on the map. And so Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south. Rehoboam, by the way, right before he did this, forced the northern tribes to, co to comply and said, I don't care whether you're in a different kingdom, you have to comply with these taxes. Of course, that was bad news. Now, Jeroboam, their new leader, is now in power, and what does he do? He says, this system of worshiping God is corrupt. We're now going to worship other gods like all the rest of the nations of the world do. And so he turned the northern kingdom into a kingdom of idolatry, booted the priests out who wanted to be, remain loyal to Yahweh. It's interesting that one of the commentators that I consulted observed, thus the great work of David for a united kingdom was shattered by inferiors, both Jeroboam and Rehoboam, who put personal ambitions above great ideals. Interesting that the proverb is written, a wise servant will rule over a son who causes shame and will share an inheritance among the brothers. Very interesting. Verse 3, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. Well, what's this one all about? So if you're going to refine silver or gold, intense heat, it has to be applied. In fact, if you notice, the refining pot is silver, the furnace for gold. And there's a reason for that. Silver liquefies at 700, 1,760 degrees, while gold liquefies almost 200 degrees higher at 1,948 degrees, hence the refining pot and the uh, furnace. Now, when the metal is liquefied, all the worthless impurities will rise to the top, and they can be removed and skimmed off the top as dross. And that process required multiple times of heating and then cooling, heating and then cooling, heating and then cooling, before the metal became pure. It was interesting to note that how did they know it was pure? It's because the refiner's face was reflected in the hot metal. 
And so you stop and think about that, and that's the way they had it. They didn't have special technology to measure stuff. It was the refiner's face reflected there. But this is not just talking about refining metal, is it? It says the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. Well, what's going on here is the process of refining the heart is being likened to the process of refining these two precious metals. Each human being is born into a sinful state. We didn't need any special training to be sinful. Our hearts are incurably wicked. Remember that what Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful among all th things and desperately, read that incurably, wicked. Who can know it? Only the Lord can know the heart. So the process of refining a heart is being likened to the process of refining metals. Lots of heat and repetition. Isn't it interesting that wisdom comes from repetition, pounding in, multiple, multiple learnings? The moment of salvation, a believer gets a new heart. Ezekiel 36 prophesied this when he said in verses 26 and 27, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. But this refining process, when each of us, if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you believe that God used his death on the cross as your payment for your sin, if you believe that, then at the moment of your justification, this new heart and this new spirit, and also the mind of Christ, was given to you. Now, it's new equipment. It's with all new equipment, A, we gotta read the manual, and B, we have to work with it a little bit before we become familiar with it. Here's the challenge. If you're gonna refine metal, you see the reflection of the refiner. If you want to refine a believer, you see the reflection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Mm. Gives me the goosebumps. An evildoer gives heed to false lips. A liar listens eagerly to a spiteful tongue. Well, let's take a look at what this is. So God tests the heart of every person. Now, verse 4 considers the hearts of evildoers and liars, because you've got an evildoer and you've got a liar here in this particular proverb, verse 4. So an evildoer, a ra'ah, means wicked, bad, either physically, morally, or socially, good for nothing, like worthless dross, like the stuff you'd skim off of refining silver and gold. A liar, a shakur, is someone who's a sham, who's false, deceitful. They deliberately tell lies for some type of personal gain. That's what's, just, that's what's implied in that word, shakur. Both the evildoer and liar exercise their incurably wicked hearts by defrauding and defaming others with mean spirits and glee. Those who like to do this stuff actually get a kick out of it. That's why they do it. They enjoy the gossip. They enjoy the tale-bearing because ultimately they enjoy inflicting pain on others. Now, we could sit here and wonder why somebody does that, but you don't have to look far to find people that just get delighted when they have a piece of gossip to, to, to pass on. And that's part of it. So their hearts are really willing tools of Satan. This is the father of all lives, as we know. But Proverbs 17, 4 sets up a downward spiral that reflects several of the stages of a wickedly incurable heart. And one specifically that's given over to malicious lying. So we're going to look at what happens in the spiral. A person starts with an evil heart. Well, then what do they do? They do evil. Of course, they reflect what's in their heart. They also tell lies. Well, what happens there? They have a spiteful tongue. They tell lies for a purpose to hurt and all becoming a tool of Satan. That process is where, why a person may not set out to say, you know, I want to become a tool of Satan. That's what they're, in a sense, doing by allowing this downward spiral to occur. A downward spiral means that it doesn't all happen at once, 
in one step, just like refining doesn't happen at once in one step. You can see the, you see the parallels here that, that, he, that he's drawing. Satan energizes a person's heart every step of the way. Jesus Christ points this out to us as he's dealing with the Pharisees that were plotting to kill him. Matthew 12, 34, 37, he's, this is what he's saying to, by the way, probably not out of how to win friends and influence people, but he's, he says, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? Pointing out the fact that they're spouting off Mosaic law while being absolutely rotten to the heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, by your words you will be condemned. Now, I think that's really interesting as we see how this is threaded through the remainder here of, of this passage. Proverbs 17, 5, he who mocks the poor reproaches his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. Well, there's something happening here. There are people in life who take pleasure at the misfortune of others. There's some that take pleasure in gossip, as we just talked about. Now he's talking about people that take pleasure in the misfortune of others. And so they look down from their lofty, I've made it, and I'm, there's a stereotypical picture here of a, a successful business person looking down on a homeless person, and what, what does he do? Why does he get a job, you lazy bum? Well, that's encouraging. That's helping that person change their situation in life. What are they, so he's talking about this mocking of the poor. That would be an example of a way that someone might mock a poor person. But every human being, rich or poor, have a, an absolutely stark and obvious commonality. That commonality is God created them in his image. It says God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. The fact is that the poor person and the rich person, the successful person and the unsuccessful person, whatever comparison you want to make, Every human being is created in the image of God. So when you are mocking the poor, you're essentially mocking and reviling God because that's God's image that you're mocking and reviling. You see, sometimes we don't stop and think about that. We're so self-focused and so aware of what, how we see things that we don't look at the bigger picture. And one of the things that Solomon does in this book of Proverbs is catch our attention and help us to stop and think about things a little deeper before we just rush into action. We're so much conditioned in our culture to just rush into action, but that's not a good thing. And so we've got to use the, the equipment that God gave us in this wisdom. We need to use it. But Lest we go any further, remember that God keeps a detailed record of every word, thought, and deed in a person's life. We just read this a minute ago. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. Evil man out of evil treasure brings forth evil things. But get this. I say to you that for every idle word that men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words, what you said... And you'll be justified by your words, you'll be condemned. It's not just your deeds, it's your words as well. And there I say it's the attitudes behind each. Because that those attitudes reflect what's in your heart. So what did you do in your heart? The unbeliever, by the way, the person that's not saved, every malicious word, thought, and deed will count against them at the great white throne judgment. There'll be an accounting. And every word, thought, and deed that was there will be there. By the way, someone says, how can you do that with all the human beings that have been born and died? And How can you do that? Well, we fail to forget that in heaven, there is no time. 
There's no time. He, he, the earth is put into a limitation called time. Outside of time, when these judgments occur, there is no time. So the point is, and by the way, at the great white throne judgment, heaven and earth are fled away. So this is going to be a enormously, from our perspective, long process. But from eternity, it's an eternity. So that's the point we need to bear in mind also. See, for the believer, every unrepentant, malicious thought, word, and deed will count as a loss of rewards at the beam of seed of Christ. You see, you won't be judged for your sin if you're, if you're a believer. You'll be judged for your actions, thoughts, and words when you were a, you know, from your moment of being saved. Now, remember that you have the Christian's bar of soap that you can confess, repent of your sins, and receive ongoing forgiveness, which is allows you to be in a, a perpetually cleansed state, but it's something you need to do all the time. So we need to be searching our hearts. We need to be asking God to show us what's inside of us that we aren't seeing by ourselves, because as we've seen, we're easily deceived. So we need to keep asking God to show us that stuff so that we wise up and live right. All right, Proverbs 6. Children's children are the crown of old men. Dare I say old women too? And the glory of, of children is their father. So this proverb, when we look at this particular proverb, let's take a look at the life principles that this proverb teaches. First of all, by the time parents become grandparents, they're late in their careers. The, you got 20 years of raising kids, and you rent them. You rent them until they're of age, and they make their own choices. So usually, at the end of one's career, one's probably going to be spending much more time with their children than they did when they were at the height of their working career. And they also will take a look at their grandchildren now that they're delighting in and tending to be much more doting on them and much more forgiving. They were probably stricter parents than they were as grandparents. And they were expecting their kids, by the way, now the parents of the grandchildren, to be much more enforcing of things. But they're also stepping in and saying, hey, you know, I'm noticing this trend in our granddaughter. Um, what are you doing about it? So, but parents usually prefer that the grandparents stay out of that kind of thing. And grandparents, let's face it, we like the fact we can get them for a little while, we can give them back. So, you know, we take advantage of that. The mistakes, by the way, that you make as a parent, you're painfully aware of because you make mistakes. And so as a grandparent, you try not to be that way. And as tendency for most human beings is, if we say, well, one way is good, then I need to do more of it, we tend to swing from being more strict to being less strict And uh, as, as grandparents. So that is a tendency. To a young child, by the way, just remember, mom and dad are the heroes of their lives. They're the first teachers of the children and the role model for the children. And so a comment that's pretty common is when I was six, I knew my mom and dad were the smartest people on earth. But by the time I was 16, they had somehow grown stupid and I got smarter. But now that I'm 26, it was like they're suddenly brilliant again. And that is so true. Most children go through that period of time where they think that their kids, that their parents are just out of it. They're past it. They're stupid. They somehow don't get it. You know, they're not quite as quick as picking up the things that the kids are doing behind the parents' back. And so they think they can get away with stuff. But it turns out as they gain some wisdom and start dealing with the truth of life, that all of a sudden they realize their parents weren't so dumb after all. All right, verse 7. Excellent speech is not becoming to a fool, much less lying lips to a prince. Again, there's a comparison here. So... Becoming, it's not becoming, nave, it means suitable, beautiful, attractive, appropriate would be a good word. Fools are characterized by speech that's typically arrogant, self-promoting, based generally on worldly, not godly principles. I can do this. 
I could, I don't, I don't need to obey that. I could, I know better. But God doesn't know the circumstances that I'm in. Sure, He does. A fool will always reveal themselves by having a "I'm smarter than than everybody else" attitude. So, a fool speaking something that's suitable and appropriate is totally incongruent with being a fool. You just you would never expect a fool to speak something that's incongruent. Even if a fool was speaking godly wisdom, people would probably discard it if that person was known to be a fool. That's why many times when people get saved and they come from a situation that they're characterized by foolish behavior, and now all of a sudden they are rescued by Jesus Christ, and now they begin to learn many of the people that they that were familiar with them acting a fool won't get it, and they'll say, what the heck happened to you? And they'll probably think it's a phase. Hmm. By the way, I'm reminded that a broken clock is right twice a day, always. So you have that going for a fool. They will say some things sometimes that are actually wise. On the other hand, a prince, so actually speak is not becoming to a fool, but much less lying lips to a prince. A prince in Solomon's day would have had a privileged upbringing. They were educated in all the basics of the law, all the culture, history, science, literature. They had the best schools and the best education possible. And they knew as a prince, especially in Israel, they knew the law. They were expert in the law because they were expected one day to administer the law from the throne. So all those princes that were around the place would be well-educated. A prince would be expected to deport himself with a lot of refinement. They would be not coarse in speech. They would be quite knowledgeable, and you would expect that. So how do the fool and the prince both use human speech? That's what we really need to look at to get the meaning of this particular proverb. Both speak based on the character and what's in their hearts. We always speak out of the treasure of our hearts. So whatever's in our heart, we're speaking. If there's no godly treasure in the heart, you're either a fool, a scorner, or wicked. So you look at, at what's coming out in the speech. You'd expect the fool to lie and never use excellent speech, and you'd expect the prince to use excellent speech and never lie tying it back to what we just looked at a few verses ago. But this proverb's real message is it is absurd to someone when someone behaves opposite of what you would expect them to behave based on their character. It's the character of the person that we need to be observing, not just what comes out of their mouth, because what comes out of their mouth is supposed to be reflecting what's in their heart. What's in their heart is going to be reflected by their character over time. How many people do you know that say one thing and do just the opposite? So if we paid attention to what's coming out of their mouth, <laughs> we'd be wrong. Look at what the person's track record is. And Solomon's pointing this to, this to us to say, look at the behavior, look at the human heart, see what's really in there. That's the real person. All right, verse 8. A present is a precious stone in the eyes of its possessor. Wherever he turns, he prospers. Hmm, a present is a precious stone. The word present is the word shakad. It means giving something of value in order to induce a specific response. So if you give a child or a spouse something a value is a surprise. You are looking for that person to be delighted, right? You're not looking for them to go and pull their fist back and hit you in the face for it. So you're expecting some, You're expecting a response. This word is broad. It can mean a gift, an inducement, an incentive, or even a bribe. So it has a wide range of applications, both very positive and some potentially negative. This proverb is really talking about human nature, how receiving something of value generally moves someone to action, 
to act differently or think differently. So the giving of a gift, specifically when it's unexpected, will predispose the recipient to favor the giver. You know, we usually, when we see behavior, and if you've been around kids on Christmas morning, and they're getting, you know, they're ripping through the paper to rip off stuff to see what they got, um, they're absolutely delighted, but they will usually obey mom and dad a whole lot that morning, especially before they get after the gifts, because they're expecting something. And so it's a change of behavior. It may be a temporary change of behavior. Billy, don't pull your sister's hair. You know, we have this stuff going on in families, but the, the issue is it's a predisposition. Understand that when you're presenting something, you're looking for a response. Most of us don't drop off a present in the mailbox and then turn off our phones. We give it in person. This proverb, by the way, neither promotes nor condones the giver trying to influence the recipient. It's just an observation about human nature. So we can't read too much into this. So let's go back to the story of one of Solomon's ancestors, Jacob. We know the story of Jacob. You can read all about him in the book of Genesis. Jacob had defrauded his older brother Esau. The older brother received what portion of an inheritance? A double portion, right? So Jacob, being the conniver, the heel catcher that he was, defrauded his older brother when he came back from being out and was famished. And Jacob probably contrived this, knowing Jacob's nature, said, hey, if you, if you let me take your role as firstborn, you can have this wonderful stew that I made, which, you know, talks about some of the character of Esau, that he was willing to sell his inheritance, literally, for a pot of stew. But Jacob didn't stop there. Most deceivers don't stop there. He induced, this, he induced his, his brother to sell his birthright for stew. But then a couple of chapters later, when Isaac was old and blind, what he did is he put on a hairy garment because Esau was hairy. I mean, the dude had a lot of hair. He's like patting a goat. And so J uh, Jacob put on this, this garment of hair and told his father that he was Esau. And Jacob, as was the custom, felt, said, oh, yeah, that's Esau, right? Recognize that hairy dude anywhere. What did he do? He gave him a blessing of the firstborn, which was equivalent to codifying the double inheritance. No wonder when Esau came back was, and found this out was furious and swore that he would be revenged on his brother. And so Jacob fled into exile. So you had this tension in this family, palpable. You could have cut it with a knife. So they're living apart. But Jacob realizes he has to come home at some time. And so how is he going to do this? Because his brother swore that if he ever crossed into his brother's land, he would kill him. What does he do? He, he contrives a method of sending gifts. And what he did is he equipped one servant and another servant and another servant, each carrying a big gift ahead of him. There was a servant trail, maybe a mile long, of carrying of gifts. And the whole idea with this repetition with each gift that was placed into Esau's hand by the servant in the name of Jacob, you know, you're going to forgive the guy. And by the time that that happened, see, Jacob used a shakad to get Esau to receive him favorably. There's an example of a shakad being used. And so you think, okay, that's something of the Bible. But guess what? We do this today. We're using shakads all the time. We bribe our parent, our, our children, rather, to behave and perform well. You know, this week, I'm at my daughter's house. We're having dinner, and she's got four children. And, well, if you eat all of your dinner, you may have dessert. And that's a shakad, a bribe. Teachers bribe students. Come on, you bribed your students when you were a teacher, if you were a teacher here. 
you, you grades are a great way. We it's about that grade, and we pl we place a whole lot of value on what that recipient, what the what the grade level is. Employers bribe employees with promotions and raises. It's an inducement. The cards do take on a wide variety here, but bribes you could induce someone to behave against the law. That's what a bribe is. So shikad, just a, it's a good word to keep in your vocabulary, has a lot of different applications. The second part of verse 7 here, wherever he turns, he prospers, says that someone who's always bearing gifts always gets received favorably wherever he goes. I was in telecommunications for part of my career, and we had uh, the Nippon Telephone Company come over from Japan and send representatives. And I re had never done business with the Japanese, and so I was coached on what to do with that. And they came in customarily, as is custom, very small, um, you and I would call them tchotchkes, small elements of, of value, small gifts that they would use to open up a meeting so that people would be favorable in sharing information with them. So it's very, very typical to, to do that today. So it's, it's everywhere. All right, verse 9. He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who re repeats a matter separates friends. He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. Now we look at that, we're saying, okay, what's going on here? This is... The topic here is about what someone chooses to do with information he or she knows that's not widely known. We might call that gossip. Telling something about someone that's not widely known. Now, sometimes this is a good thing to do. Other times, it's not a good thing to do. So the word transgression he who covers a transgression. So what is it that they're telling about that person? It's a pesha. It's a sin. It's a trespass, rebel, rebellion, revolt. It, it's some kind of issue, some kind of sin issue that the person did, that the person who's covering the transgression and seeking love, they're covering this sin. They're covering it. They're masking it. They're making sure it wasn't being seen. In this information, in this this case here, the information pertains to the friend's sin. It's not known to others, but becomes known to the he of the proverb. So when you read this, and you look at he who covers it, it's the he, this first one, covers a transgression, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. So it's the choice of the he who knows something to disclose it or not. That's what this proverb's about. Two choices. Choice number one is he could pass the information on to others, gossip. And we looked at this particular graphic in a previous lesson, which to me still is just timeless with a gossip chain, with one person telling the next person telling the next person telling the next person. But you know what? It always comes back to the person that it involves eventually. After being passed through many hands and probably morphing into something not even remotely resembling what was originally told. But that's the problem of gossip. So you know something about someone that they did that was wrong, that's a sin, that like, an oops, what did they do? You know, this person just got arrested for drunk and disorderly. All right, now that's not something they want widely known, but you know it, you're aware of it. Maybe you were the one that came to bail them out. So what do you do with that information? That's what this is talking about. And there's, again, more to the meets the eye. The second choice that you have is to cover over what's known. In other words, not disclose it, not hold it against your sitting friend, not to separate from friendship of that person, which is what you do when you overlook or cover a transgression. This actually points to something that's really interesting in Scripture. How many places in scripture do you know that talks about a man's or a person's glory? Not too many. Glory is reserved for God, isn't it? Glory, we're not to glory in ourselves. We're to glory in what God does. 
but there's nothing in ourselves. And yet we read this really interesting verse in Proverbs 19.11. We read this. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook or cover a transgression. You will not find too many places in Scripture that talks about a man's glory. Every time you choose to do the right thing with something you know that could be harmful to another person if it got out, that is to your glory. God accounts that to you. Boy, you talk about a true friend. That's what a true friend is. As I said, many few places in Scripture you will ever find any mention of God saying, this is to your glory, John, Joe, Bill, Mary, Sue. This is to your glory. Verse 9, by the way, should be a measuring stick of where the possessor of the information about another person's transgression is in his maturity, trustworthy, and Christ-likeness. It's a way that it shows whether or not you're reflecting the image of Jesus Christ in your walk. Because you've learned through refinement, perhaps, that sharing gossip is not helpful. In fact, it's something you should avoid. We've talked about that in previous sessions. Verse 10, rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. Interesting. Rebuke and blows. All right. One verse proverb is quite plain in its meaning, but we need to take a look at this a little bit deeper because it is a deeper look at human nature. Rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. The word rebuke is gera. It's a gentle chiding, a gentle reproof or corrective feedback, admonishment. It's not a blow. It's something much more general. It's an advising someone that they're on the wrong track. Rebuke is more effective for a wise man. It's a subtle thing. You're going to a wise person and saying, I just uh, help me think through this. And you bring out something that perhaps you've seen in that person. This person, the rebuke to that person is much more effective than a hundred blows on the back of a fool. Okay. Wise people have accumulated a whole lot of wisdom over their life. One of the characteristics of a wise person is they're sensitive and open to learning. In the world of assessments, one of the things that I do professionally, I look at things like emotional intelligence. I look at um, intrinsic driving forces and motivations, behaviors. And you can see how open someone is to learning and receptive to learning versus someone who's not receptive to learning. By the way, I will say that people that are more receptive and open to learning and willing to admit that they're wrong and willing to take steps to correct it when they're wrong are much more successful and effective in this life than people that, like fools, think they know it all, like scorners than, that just deride any thought that they might be doing something wrong or just plain wicked people that want to be wicked. Wise people. So a rebuke to the wise person. They rarely need it, but when they get it, they're very open to it. They generally, they'll stop and consider it. No, they may not immediately drop to their knees and make a major confession, but it's going to they're going to turn it over in their mind. They're going to think about it. You just prompted your friend, perhaps, to improve. The wise person, if they make a mistake, wise people, though, are very quick to acknowledge that they've made a mistake. They make a mistake, they use the Christian's bar of soap, which says, confess and repent your sins and transgressions, everything's forgiven. That's what we're to do. And this is what they do whenever they make a mistake. On the other hand, a fool says, I know everything. I don't make mistakes. So you can't rebuke them because they won't acknowledge that they have anything to be rebuked for. In fact, They'll consider that you just shove them and they'll shove you back harder. That's what you get when you have a fool. The word blows then, a hundred blows on the back of a fool. The word nakah, it means to strike, smite, wound, or beat severely. 
flogging, beating with a rod, the rod of correction. That's what this is talking about. Fools do not get subtle. You could rebuke them, and it's like they didn't hear anything. They don't get a subtle thing. It has to be something so out of the ordinary that it jolts them to realization if you want to try to correct that person. Now, that's where you've got to hang on, literally, beat them, beat them with a stick. That's what this means. Before they even realize that they're being corrected. That's the difference. It's the, the, the hard-headedness of a fool versus the open receptiveness of a wise person. By the way, fools is to see every, fools always see everybody else as wrong. So when you're rebuking a fool, they're saying, no, you're wrong. When you're even starting to beat them, they're saying you're wrong. They aren't open to learning. I think it's interesting that this talks about a rebuke, one rebuke, a rebuke, very subtle, is more effective for a wise person than a hundred blows, something not subtle, something meant to catch everyone's attention. Isn't it interesting that the law limited the number of blows that you could administer as punishment to 40? This says 100. In other words, Solomon's really going out there and making this major comparison about this thing way over here and that thing way over there and talking about just how different wise people and foolish people are. In other words, this is stating an absurdity just like the absurdity when a fool speaks something becoming, like the absurdity of a prince who would lie. Again, you get to see some of these threads between the different verses of this chapter. All right, next verse. An evil man seeks only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger will be sent against him. Well, what's this talking about? In the ancient culture, the king was the ultimate authority. They were God's agent. So when you looked at this and you understand all of the passages in Scripture, it says God raises up everyone who's an authority. And he raises them up for his purposes. Sometimes he raises up a good and godly person. Sometimes he raises up an ungodly person, but they're for his purposes. And if you usually look at the story and how it ends, you're going to see what his purpose was. God will use everyone that he raises and keeps in a position of authority. So the king had ultimate authority. All right. Kings would not tolerate the slightest amount of rebellion. The one thing that we can see throughout history is if there was a sense of disrest, of unrest and, and uh, rebellion going on, kings would immediately dispatch someone to punish them. The Romans, for example, were so obsessed with this issue of keeping rebellion down that if you had any kind of tumult going on in any of the Roman cities, the officials of those cities would be held accountable and in many cases put to death if they allowed a rebellion in their city. So the city officials had incentives to keep the rebellion down. They were acting as an agent for the king, who's now acting as an agent for God himself. An evil man in this, an evil man seeks only rebellion. He's someone who's progressed to the terminal stages of wickedness. They're in full rebellion. They're not recognizing God's authority to have appointed that king. Whether that king was good or bad is not the issue. They're not recognizing the authority of God to have individuals on this planet to administer people and situations, governments. The word cruel messenger is the word Azeri Malak. It is one who is sent by God who is terrible and cruel. The Septuagint translates this as terrible angel, this, this word, a terrible angel. Let me give you an example of a terrible angel. And again, this should not be lost um, when we look at what happened here with this particular terrible angel. This is an avenging angel, which, which will is sent to deal with people that are in rebellion, disobeying God. Second Kings 1935 
And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. Now, if you would know anything about this era in human history, the Assyrians were massing against Jerusalem. Hezekiah prevailed on God to save Jerusalem, which God did, and God honored that. But the Assyrians persisted in their siege of Jerusalem, and so God dispatched an angel, one angel, one night, killed 185,000 Assyrians. So you're talking about almost 400,000 Assyrians assembled against the nation of Israel and against Jerusalem. And again, in the culture of that day, it says here some, when people arose in the morning. Well, actually, many historians look at this passage and say, if you want to strike terror into your enemy, then you go to where they all are sleeping and you kill every other person. So when someone wakes up, there's a dead body on either side of them, they're alive and they realize they better get out of there, that they're in mortal danger. Why didn't the person kill them? The person chose not to kill them, but they're next if they don't heed the warning, which is what rebels need to understand. If they don't heed the warning, eventually it's going to kill them. God absolutely hates rebellion against the leaders that he's raised up. He will dispatch his messengers to put down a rebellion, to remove his hedge of protection sometimes. He'll simply, as he did with the northern kingdom, he removed his, his hedge of protection and allowed the Assyrians to come in and take out the northern kingdom because they were in rebellion against him. By the way, he'll also abandon rebels to natural consequences. You know, in history, there's always somebody who will come along who's bigger and stronger who will take out the person that just took out the person that they were bigger than stronger than. So that's, a, that's just a pattern of history. All right, last passage for today. Let a man meet a bear cub, or a bear rather, robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. Okay, we're talking about foolish behavior. Again, a comparison, a metaphor is being made. So what is this actually telling us about? Again, another absurd comparative that describes how difficult it is to deal with a fool in the midst of their folly. Remember, the last thing we talked about is you, you're going to get a, a rebuke for a king. It can take you 100 blows to catch the attention of a fool. Here, it's this wild, ravenous bear that, moreover, that bears a mother and the cubs were taken. Um, that's not someone that you want to meet. And it's easier to deal with the bear. That's what he's saying. So he's likely citing something called the Syrian brown bear, which is now extinct in Israel, or the Eurasian brown bear, which is a larger of the two. One of those two types of bears are being identified as the bear here that is quite angry. Mother bears are very protective of their cubs. Cubs are born during hibernation in the winter. They usually go into caves or hollows in the earth where it's warm. And for a number of months, will hibernate there. A mother bear will give birth because she's, she's eaten huge amounts prior to going into hibernation. So the young ones are born. Their natural instinct is to nurse off the mom. When the mom finally wakes up after the process, and you know she's like, I am hungry. And she would be because she's not eaten anything for a couple of months. Moreover, She's been feeding young cubs. And so she goes out of her den in search for food. And the cubs are going to be not going to be left in the den. The cubs will follow the mom. They're big enough to do that. And so they're going to be traipsing after the mother. And the mom's not in a good mood because she's hungry. Bears usually avoid people, but mother bears are very, very, very aggressive, especially when their cubs are small. In fact, 70% of grizzly bear killings of human beings are, be, are by mothers in defense of their cubs. Somebody's driving out in one of the national parks, sees a little bear cub, oh, he's so cute, let's go pat him. Not a wise move, because mama bear is probably close by, and she's not going to tolerate that. She sees it as a 
an attack on her cub. So a mother bear robbed of her cubs is going to be berserk with anger, will attack anything and everything responsible for a loss of a cub. Understand, this bear is literally insane, very, very strong, eight, nine hundred thousand pounds of ferocious bear with claws that long, and you don't stand a chance. Solomon's saying, let a man, it's better to be dealing with a mother bear robbed of her cubs than with a fool during the time of his folly, which I think is a, an interesting comparison. You can't correct a fool in his folly because a fool thinks he's the smartest person, won't make mistakes, can't make mistakes. That's what a fool does. So I think these are, these are very interesting passages here. I think you can begin to see the, the common thread that's between all of them. Solomon really has a lot to say about fools, and we need to understand because if we, nothing present, prevents, by the way, a Christian from acting the fool. We can all act the fool. Wise people can act the fool. So we just need to be very much aware of that. And with that thought, I want to close this for today. We'll pick it up next time. But my prayer is that God will use the things that we've talked about today and help us to grow and help us to mature in our faith. So please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time together. We thank you for the truth of your word and the colorful nature which Solomon uses to describe everyday life situations. We can easily see ourselves in all of these situations and probably can envision people that apply to some of the passages. And Lord, as we think about these things and realize that you've placed us here at this day and time with the people with whom you've placed us, you placed us where you wanted us for a reason. So Father, just as you drew us here this morning to hear your word, Lord, help us to digest this word, help it to, de to go deep into our souls that we might not only think differently, but act differently and act in accordance with a desire to become more and more reflective of the person of Jesus Christ. You put us in life here to refine us. May your refinement not only be successful, but may you encourage our hearts so that we are a reflection of Jesus Christ to the rest of the world. We thank you for this time together, Lord. We praise you in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ. God's people said, amen and amen.